nail anatomy and care. And um, I, I don't know because I've never actually gone to um, nail school and taken the course. Um, but everything that I've heard is that it's not nearly as detailed as what I teach, which in a way is kind of sad because the most important thing, in my opinion, and Doug Shun's opinion, who is my mentor and the author of Nail Structure and Product Chemistry, um, is if you are messing with the nail plate and it is the canvas for everything that you do, you should know everything about this canvas inside and out and how to take care of it. And unfortunately, I think a lot more time is spent on products and how to apply them versus really understanding the chemistry of it because um, it's seen as a fairly simple job, but it's a very, very complex job. And um, I'm, I think we're really blessed to find people who take it just as seriously and, um, and really try and make a profession out of it rather than just a job. All right, so anatomy, we're gonna go through all the different parts. Um, and the, this is kind of, this is Doug's picture of all of the things. And so we'll just go through them one by one. Um, but the first place that we wanna start is actually the bone. So uh, one of the purposes of the nail plate and the nail bed, as we know, is to protect the fingertip bones. And it determines the over, your bone actually determines the overall length, shape, curvature, and spread of your nail unit. So the bone has a lot, a lot of influence on what your nails look like. And um, so when people ask me, can I change my nail shape? Can I change the thickness of my nail plate and all of that? You're going to learn that, you yeah, know, you really can't. You, you know, that whole God given th blessings and all of that. You, what you've got is what you've got. Now, can proper care improve what you've got? Heck yeah. So, and I have really, really thin nails. You guys know it. You've seen pictures. I have really thin nails and they get long because I know how to take care of them. Since the bone affects the curvature of the matrix and the matrix, we'll talk a little bit more. Um, it also has a great influence on the curvature of that nail plate itself. So, um, when people say I have a flat C curve or a, a strong C curve. So that C curve is the amount of curvature that your nail has um, when you look at it from the ends, from the free edge. Okay, that's again determined by the shape and size of your bone. The nail plate. This is a really kind of a, it seems like a duh, but as I go through and separate the difference between the nail plate and the nail bed, um, it drives me and Doug and a lot of other people wacko when you use the terms incorrectly. So the nail plate is hard and you can think of the nail bed as soft and squishy, just like your bed, hopefully. Um, so the nail plate starts back here at the matrix. So we see where what, what we're seeing actually starts right here. Okay, this is what we think of as the cuticle and goes all the way to here and then becomes your free edge. Okay, um, but what we don't know is that the nail actually starts way back here and it takes one to two months to get to where we can actually see it. Okay, and then to get to becoming your free edge is another four to six months depending on how quickly or slowly your nails grow in terms of replacing themselves. So this is why I always kind of laugh to myself. Um, <laughs> yes, to myself. When people say, I've been taking biotin, which is a B vitamin, I've been taking biotin and uh, for a week and my nails feel significantly stronger. And I'm like, yeah, honey, that's all in your head because uh, you aren't going to feel the strength of what's happening here if by taking biotin which is then the matrix is going to deliver all of those vitamins and nutrients. Um, you're not going to see that till it gets and feel it till it gets up to there. So it's like you got to be taking biotin for at least six months before you actually start to go, oh, that's made a difference. Now, can biotin make a big difference in um, 
the integrity of your nail plate? For a lot of people, yes. What does that mean? Probably that they're running low in their B vitamins all the time. So um, it's really, it, you know, Doug talks about that vitamins can't make your nails stronger than normal, but the lack of vitamins can certainly make them weaker. So then that's where we go, oh, B vitamin helps. Okay, well, it's going to help some people. It's not going to help everyone. So the nail plate is composed of hardened, flat, translucent, non-living. Key word right there. Non-living. That means dead. I know it seems kind of redundant, but dead. Let me say it again. Dead. <laughs> Keratin cells that form a solid protective layer over the underlying soft tissue, which is the nail bed. Okay, so the reason that we can see this pink area is because um, the right blend of moisture and oil has made the nail plate translucent, okay? All right, uh, the nail plate should not be confused with the nail bed, okay? And as you learn this and you'll be like, oh, why can't people just get it right? And honestly, it's because we're taught as the wrong thing when we're like knee high to a grasshopper. Where did that expression come from? Very American. Um, anyway, when you were really, really small, uh, you learned and you were, when your parents were and your teachers were teaching you about the parts of your fingers, um, it's been labeled wrong from the very beginning. And it's hard to change something that you have learned since you were like seven years old or even younger. The average person has about 50 layers of keratin cells that make up the nail plate. So unfortunately, it's not like 50 layers of a book. It's all this mishmash hodgepodge of, um, as you'll see in a minute, of the nail cells. Um, and so, and how they create this structure, this hard structure on top of this, um, of all of this soft, squishy skin and these different layers of skin that we have. Keratin. We've all heard the word. Uh, we Sometimes we think we know what it means. Uh, it's, it's a word that can be misused in marketing in terms of thinking, oh, well, since my hair and my nails are made of a protein called keratin that um, if I apply keratin on top of it, it's going to make it better. And the answer for both is no. Um, so keratin is a type of protein that's the key structural material for making up scales. So like fish scales and um, snake scales, uh, hair, nails, feathers for birds, horns, hooves, calluses. That's a, something that we deal with and the outer layer of skin among vertebrates. And vertebrates are those of us with a spine. Um, keratin also protects the epithelial, epithelial, say that three times real fast, which are your skin, that's a fancy word for your skin cells from damage or stress. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is what your nail cells look like under the microscope, okay? So this is one cell. Okay, and it goes off the edge somewhere. And then we've got another one that actually is quite large. Okay, and that one, and then this one goes this way and tucks under there. And then we've got another one that layers on top this way. So you can see that just, they're just sort of this hodgepodge of, of a bunch of cells. And this is the hard keratin structure. Now, it's not solid. As you can see, there's a whole bunch of holes, okay? Also, you can see that in this area, there's a bigger gap, okay? And this is where I think water and oils get in faster and it's more difficult for them to get into these grooves. Now, water can go through all of these teeny tiny little holes and it also goes around the cells. Now oils, only certain oils, not all of them, certain oils can get around the cells, 
but cannot go through those tiny holes. Their cell structure, their structure is too large, their molecular structure. So my mentor, Doug Shoon, the author of Nail Structure and Product Chemistry, looks very dashing in a crisp white shirt, I must say. Okay, he says normal nail plates contain about 18% water by weight, and the flexibility is highest when the nail plate is saturated with water at about 25% moisture. Okay, that's too much. But too much moisture can weaken the nail plate and lead to damage, which uh, we see as tearing. Nails that are consistently exposed to water can become soft and weak. This is such a great visual in terms of thinking about the, that slide of what your cells look like and then thinking of them like a sponge. And they can hold, your nails can hold one third their weight in water. And it doesn't sound like much, cause you know, we drink a lot of water during the day, but that's enough to increase the moisture percentage that then makes them overly flexible, overly soft and weak. Too much water leads to splitting, peeling and breakage. Um, it leads to that softening, over softening of the nails and this extra water can cause them to swell and then contract and then dry. And we repeat this process over and over as we wash our hands furiously during virus seasons and we wash way too many dishes and laundry and long hot showers. Yeah, you know, in a way we're our own worst enemy. Um, and so that repeated swelling and contracting of, contracting of the nail plates may lead to peeling, splitting, and all of the other problems of your free edge. So Doug talks about now, on the other hand, too little moisture can leave the plate dry and brittle. So the correct moisture level is vital to healthy nails. And unfortunately, water is great at taking away more water um, and also the oil that's in your nail plate. Let's talk about that nail bed. So we've finished talking about the nail plate and now we wanna talk about the nail bed right here, this pink area here. There is actually two layers to it. The soft pink tissue, the nail bed, is that tissue that sits underneath and it supports the nail plate while it's growing. The nail bed should not, again, should not be confused with the plate. So the plate is the hard thing like your dinner plates and the bed is the soft squishy part underneath like your own bed. Until the 1980s, many scientists believed that a large portion of the nail plate keratin cells um, were from Oh, I got a typo in there. We're from the nail bed. So we originally thought that the nail cells were happening, they were being created down here. And in the 1980s, we learned, wow, that's totally wrong. Um, and so what I want you guys to realize is that um, in the medical establishment, establishment, we learn stuff all the time. We get better microscopes. Um, we can see bigger, more, and so what we learn, just like, you know, out exploring the planets and all of that stuff, we are constantly learning. And so things change. And a lot of people are resistant to that change going, well, what? But, but you said, but you said, well, yeah, we did say back in the 80s, and now we're wrong. So what we do know is that now um, the the uh, keratin cells come from the matrix back here. The nail bed supports that entire nail plate and it is enriched with many, 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 many tiny blood vessels that feed it and clean the tissue. Now, if you've ever lost your fingernail, you know that it's also filled with a whole lot of nerves and it's incredibly painful if you lose the nail plate. And that's the whole purpose of the nail plate is to protect all of this. And think about everything you do with your hands. Your hands are pretty much constantly in motion. And so the nail plate protects the fragile cells at the tip of your fingers. Like facial skin, the nail bed contains two types of tissues. There's the dermis and the epidermis. Okay, so the dermis is located when I said there was a lower layer. So the dermis is the lower layer that contains the nourishing blood vessels, which bring food and oxygen to the cells and then also carry away the waste, toxin, and carbon dioxide. While the epidermis that is underneath the plate 
it's a little different. It closely resembles the inside lining of your mouth. And it's a very special type of epidermis called bed epithelium. And it is only, this is the only place that it is found, is underneath the nail plate. Of all of the different types of cells that we have in our body, bed epithelium is only found in the nail bed. It is a sticky tissue that adheres tightly to the bottom of the nail plate. So it's very, very important. It's like double-sided sticky tape that you just cannot rip off. Um, and if you do, it's incredibly painful. It's gonna take all kinds of things with it. So we really, really need that. And so you'll learn that all of these parts are trying to hold all of this together to keep germs and bacteria away from the matrix. Whenever we're looking at this, just think again, I think I've given you the trick to remember is that your nail plate is hard like your dinner plate and your nail bed is soft and squishy like your bed. Now, here is the most important factory that we all love because we love the results of our long fingernails, but we, what we don't see is this matrix way back here. So this is where your cuticle line is here. Okay, and way back here, so starting at that cuticle line is the matrix. And this is where your cells are created, okay? Um, they're created there and the nail plate begins to form. Um, the matrix produces this super tough protein, which we've already talked about, called keratin, okay? It's different from other things. And remember, those cells are dead. They are the, the, these cells are the building blocks that form your actual nail plate. Um, the matrix is opaque, so it's more solid colored, uh, bluish white, almost a rectangular area of tightly specialized cells. Now I wanna talk about the rectangular area in a little bit because the matrix as well as the bone determines the size, shape, and curvature of your nail. So these specialized cells are designed to take the nutrients that we eat and turn them into amazingly tough and durable substance. So if you want to make your nails stronger, you've got to eat better, you gotta drink more water. If the matrix becomes damaged, the effects are usually seen in the nail plate. Okay, so if we damage the matrix, and we can damage it in any of these areas, okay? And a lot of times, if we have forces that come down and damage it enough, we will then see that in the nail plate. Damage to that matrix area can cause splits, ridges, white spots, and other deformities of the natural nail plate. And we've all seen them, okay? Some of them are just simply bruises, and some of them are permanent. If that matrix, that damage to the matrix is severe enough, it could lead to permanent deformity. And unfortunately, when you have done serious damage enough, it's forever. The size and the shape of the matrix determines the thickness, the width, and the curvature of your nail plate. A wider, this was, this was kind of cool, a wider matrix creates a wider nail plate. Longer matrices make thicker plates. While people with naturally thin plates, yeah, raise his hand right here, naturally thin plates must have a shorter matrix area. And unfortunately, none of us know how, how big or small our matrix really is. All right, the lunula, or often called the moon, it's a bluish white opaque. Does that sound familiar? Bluish white opaque. So uh, same color as the matrix. Um, it's visible through the nail plate. This area is the front part of the nail matrix. Sometimes it's called the moon. All right, so this is my our beloved James, one of our team members. Um, and so his lunula is here. Now this is the beginning of his matrix. Now notice that if I was to continue um, his finger, his fingertip follows that exact same shape. Okay, um, so if we were to think about how, okay, if this is the exposed portion of the matrix that we can see, and it goes off this way, because it's got to go as wide as your nail, okay, so it's going to go off this way and off this way. So there's all kinds of things that can happen in terms of damage along here that can 
can damage the nail plate. And here's why when people say, oh, I really wish I had moons like you. We've seen different bloggers and some of them have, you can see the lunula on every single nail. And I'm like, no, 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 you, you don't wish that. Because when we're talking about damage to the nail plate um, or the, the matrix, this area is all covered with this thick layer of skin. This part of the matrix is not covered with skin. So the odds of bruising that are far higher. Not all fingers have a visible unula. Um, it's easiest to find it on your thumb or your index finger. I can only see mine on my thumb and it's just barely. Whereas like James and my husband Corey, you can see it on every single finger. The lunula also determines the shape of the nail plate and the free edge. And like I was saying earlier, they can have the same crescent shape. So James's uh, matrix is here and his fingertip follows the same shape. The guardian seals, and I'm gonna talk a lot more about all of this because the guardian seals are so important. A little bit like Galaxy of the Guardians, that movie. Guardians of the Galaxy, here, wow. I've been working late. <laughs> um, anyway, so we have the proximal nail fold, which means nearest. So proximal nail fold is nearest to the matrix, okay? And then we have the hyponychium right here, and then we have two lateral nail folds, okay? Lateral means side, and so those are actually, you've got two of them on the side, so one plus one plus two. Um, the purpose of these guardian seals is to create a tight seal to prevent bacteria, germs, and chemicals from getting underneath the nail plate um, because everything has to be sealed up nice and tight so you cannot get germs and bacteria under here because what happens is as germs and bacteria get under here and they head back here, you can end up damaging your nail plate uh, permanently. And we're trying to avoid that. These lateral folds are right here. Yep, these are my nails. And then your proximal nail fold is back here. Um, and then your hyponychium is underneath here. This is another view of how the lateral folds work. And so it's on the sides here. And if you think about all of this skin and then it bunches up underneath here and connects there, this seal is really, really important. So we've got all four sides of the nail bed that needs to be protected. Um, and the nail bed is that first line of defense before the matrix. Right. The hyponychium, uh, it is the soft tissue seal underneath your extended free edge uh, of the nail plate. And its purpose, again, is to prevent um, bacteria, fungi, viruses, etc., from infecting the nail bed by forming that watertight seal. Okay, so all of these are really, really important. And I know a lot of people get obsessed with cleaning under their nails and they end up pushing back on this area, not thinking about the fact that you actually are kind of, you're breaking this seal. So, and I know some people, they'll get um, more growth of like this skin area seems to come up farther on the nail. That's actually something called pterygium. And it's a big complex thing that Doug is actually still finishing the article. I know he's got several versions of it about pterygium. It starts with a P, T, like pterodactyl. Um, and it is something that is filled with lots and lots of blood and nerves and is something that should not be cut or even pushed back. The anechodermal band. Um, this is a band of bunched up tissue behind the hyponychium. And so it will, you'll see it as different colors for different people, but it's right there. So the hyponychium is that bunched up layer of skin cells. And you can see that it's about through here is, much, is a much darker pink. Okay, that is the anechodermal band and is actually different type of skin cells. And it helps keep the germs and bacteria out as well. This band improves the ability of the hyponychium to prevent pathogens from infecting the nail bed. So the, the body has made up like this massive fortress to try and keep germs and bacteria out. And sometimes we're our own worst enemies in this desire to have clean, perfect nails. 
But when you think about everything that you do with your hands, the odds of you having dirt under your fingernails or dust or fuzz or these things that we sort of get neurotic about, um, it's time to let that go. You know, as long as your hands are really clean and you're not sticking your hands in your mouth all the time, um, it's okay if there's a tiny little bit of dust or dirt underneath your fingernails. If you are obsessed with having to clean underneath, then what you need to do is use a makeup brush and um, either water or rubbing alcohol. Acetone's a little harsh. You don't need to be using acetone. But um, just using a brush and don't start here in the middle. What you wanna do is start here on the side with a brush and just very carefully sweep the dust, dirt, whatever out from underneath your fingernails. And if it's a little bit of polished, do not obsess with getting that out because what you end up doing is pushing back on this hyponychium and you're shortening it. And you can't, if you do that enough, you know, it can be permanent. If you do it on accident or you know, just every once in a while, you most likely will recover. But this is why people who have shorter, um, who have been biting, they've been biting back this hyponychium and they keep pushing it back with their teeth. And eventually the body goes, okay, well, if that's what's going to be happening, then this is where the hyponychium is going to get moved to. Okay. And once that happens, that it's moved to that point, it's done. So we really want to be careful with how much biting and scraping and all of that that you do against the hyponychium. All right, this is the big one, the proximal nail fold. We used to think, and even like when I was learning from Doug, we were thinking that this was just, this whole area was the proximal nail fold. Well, we're really learning that the proximal nail fold goes all the way back to your first knuckle. Because we honestly have no idea how far back your matrix goes. It, you know, for those of you who have a lunula, um, it's, remember Doug said it was kind of rectangular-ish shape, okay? So especially for those of you who have a lunula that it goes way far this way, um, it doesn't mean that it's an oval. It still is how that, that shape is. It's going to be more squarish. But the only way to truly know is to cut you open. And uh, I don't recommend that. One of the things that we need to talk about is calluses. And you'd be like, why are we talking about calluses? Um, a callus is an abnormal thickening of the top layer of your skin, which is composed of the natural protein keratin. Sound familiar? Um, calluses can be in form on areas that are repeatedly exposed to friction or pressure. So calluses actually are a very good thing. It's your body's way of protecting itself from harm. Continual rubbing, as you know, will give you a blister. And if you do uh, activities that will continue to rub that, in order to protect you, the body says, let's make some calluses. Let's build up some tough layers of skin that are not filled with blood vessels and all of the things, the different layers that our skin actually is. What we have all been taught wrong, incorrectly, as the cuticle is actually the keratinized proximal nail fold. And I say keratinized because it actually looks different than the rest of your proximal nail fold, okay? It's this nice tight band of skin that we are supposed to have. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the combination of how the cuticle and the proximal nail fold are this perfect companion to keeping that nice tight seal. So this happens to be, along with the hyponychium, one of the most important guardian seals, okay? Also, just as a little side, can you guys see these little dots? This was from a long time ago. So this picture was actually when I started using our nail oil formula that I created in my kitchen, um, this was four months later and my nails were longer than they had ever been. And my family was like, please, mom, you've got to cut those nails. You're going to hurt somebody. So, um, but look at how incredibly healthy they were. Um, 
and it's just really cool. But anyway, at that point is when I was learning about um, the proximal nail fold and how important it is. Looking at that picture, you could see that, and it'll come up again, and this is a nice tight band of skin. Now this is my lovely Bradley, uh, my youngest, and uh, the, the combination, so the cuticle and the proximal, the keratinized proximal nail fold work together to create this nice tight seal, okay? To keep germs and bacteria away from the matrix because this area is a shorter entry to the matrix than from this area up here, okay? So this is Bradley. Bradley does not take care of his hands and his nails, as you can tell. Um, and But he has a very, very strong cuticle like I do. Now the cuticle is the dead skin on the nail blade. So I'm gonna actually draw here so you can see the difference between what is the cuticle and what is the um, proximal nail fold. Um, actually, so his proximal nail fold goes like this. I can't quite figure out, I think that might be cuticle, but I know for sure this is his proximal nail fold, okay? And it goes all the way back here. All right, now I'm gonna to switch to blue. Here is the cuticle. Now the cuticle is dead skin that rides the nail plate. Okay, this is all cuticle. All right, now the cuticle and the proximal nail fold hold hands together. And sometimes, sometimes, they have a death grip with each other. The cuticle tissue actually rides the nail, the entire area of the nail plate. And right above that cuticle tissue is one layer of stem cells called the aponychium. Now, when I first was learning stuff with, from Doug, we thought that kind of this whole area was the aponychium. Well, now we can see things better with better microscopes. And it is actually one layer of stem cells. So it's different. And, um, and as we know, stem cells are required for growth. So it's very, very different layer of skin, okay? And so then this little gray area is that what we think of as the cuticle, and that is actually the keratinized proximal nail fold, okay? So what we're seeing with Bradley is that the cuticle is here and portions of his proximal nail fold have lifted, but some of it has not because of this death grip. And you, so what you're seeing is that the cuticle is stretching out the proximal nail fold and it's not releasing, okay? So a lot of you have may have problems like this because you're just letting it grow out. And back in 2012, when I was learning all of this stuff, and I kept hearing people and bloggers say, don't ever push back your cuticles. It's going to lead to hangnails and it's just going to damage blah, 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 blah. So I thought, well, okay, I'll do an experiment because I had always pushed that skin back. And so I did an experiment and after three weeks, my nails looked like Bradley's where I had all of this stretched out skin. And it was at that point that I went, oh, now I understand. Now I understand why when the cuticle gets, or uh, sorry, the proximal nail fold gets stretched way out to here, if you push back and you release these two, okay, then you end up with this really big piece of stretched out skin. And as we know, thin skin dries out really, really fast. And so then people will cut this and they go, well, it doesn't hurt. No, it doesn't hurt, but technically you've just, you're opening up this whole area. Let me draw and <laughs> have to cover it all up. But you're opening up this area more, okay? And germs and bacteria can get in there. This eponychium and this proximal nail fold, those should not, the pro and, and Doug was saying that this eponychium uh, skin cells should not be confused with the actual cuticle, which rides the nail plate, okay? So the two work together, hand in hand. This is James again. So what really is the cuticle? It's a thin layer of dead, 
tissue that rides the nail plate, okay? And it forms that seal between the nail plate and the epinicium, actually the proximal nail fold here. Well, okay, the epinicium, which is underneath here that we can't see, um, as well as the proximal fold, okay? So it is dead skin. And this is the important part, okay? I really like doing this picture, James' picture, okay? His cuticle goes like this. Now, any of you who have polished your nails, there's even some cuticle tissue up here. There's some up here. Any of you who have polished your nails, and if you find that you get chipping back here, your polish keeps chipping, we, guess what? Polish doesn't stick to skin. We know that. You get, you get polish over here and you get in the shower, it comes right off, all right? So if you want, if this is an issue for you where you're getting chipping back here because you want your manicure to last longer, then what we need to do is properly remove that cuticle. And that's done by softening that dead tissue up and then by gently scraping it. And you can soften it with oil, with warm oil, you can soften it with a cuticle um, remover. The thing with that is it's incredibly difficult, or it, it, well, it is, it's difficult to put, to put cuticle remover right here, but not have it touch here, okay? Um, so I have an entire video on how to properly remove the, the cuticle. Uh, I'd love to go into it, but I can't, because I'll be here till three. Um, so the cuticle pulls away from the underside of the epinicium and it attaches tenaciously to the nail plate. So it's tenaciously gripped to the nail plate as well as the keratinized proximal nail fold. So as you can see, there's just extra layers of keratin through here, okay? That's why it gets loose and, um, and dries out really easily. And so then the tendency is to want to pick at it. Um, and to cut it. I forgot I have, I, I do enough of these that I forget which slides are coming up ahead. So like actually James has cuticle way, actually goes way up to here. When you zoom in, you can see things better. So the reason that w is most of us, we can't really even see that scan. We can see it because I've zoomed in on James's picture. But for if you were to look at your own nails, that amount of skin is really, really small. So I've been talking about that death grip that it's got, that's all got going on. Okay, so this is what a healthy proximal nail fold looks like, that keratinized nice band of skin, okay? And the way that I get it like that is I do push that skin very gently back with the intention of releasing it from the cuticle. So what I wanna demonstrate is that with, like with James and Bradley, James does not push to back his keratinized proximal nail fold, okay? And it releases from the cuticle because you can see them separated. I have to push mine back, okay? I also keep it oiled and keep it, which then, hmm, look at that. It's not all dried out. Because I keep that skin nicely oiled, that's what keeps it soft. Now Bradley, Bradley doesn't push either, but he's got that death grip that's happening and stretching out his entire proximal fold. Pushing back is similar to, similar, not the same, but similar to flossing your teeth. So when we're flossing our teeth, if we don't, germs and bacteria get in there and then the tissue gets all inflamed um, and flossing actually then removes that bacteria um, that then makes your gums all red and inflamed and tempted and they tend to bleed. So the flossing, the act of flossing irritates that skin enough and makes and the body's response toughen it up. Okay. So a little bit of irritation is good. A lot of irritation not necessarily so good. Okay, and I've talked about this a whole lot, but it's really, really important for this one. We've got a really, really big problem. And it's called the Russian manicure. It's also called the e-file manicure, the dry manicure. Um, and so what I, it was started by some um, salesmen 
who were selling the microdermabrasion bits um, as a safer way to remove the, quote, cuticle, which is not the cuticle, um, but to remove it compared to clipping the skin with these really sharp cuticle clippers. What happens is they use different bits to get under here and clean off the cuticle. So they are cleaning off the cuticle off the plate, off that nail plate. But then they're also shoving this bit underneath here to loosen this skin more. So that keratinized proximal nail fold, they've lifted it up and then they take another bit and they buff that off, okay? The problem is not quite so much this part, it's the shoving the bit underneath and getting underneath that keratinized proximal nail fold and then making it disappear, okay? When in actuality, all that we needed at this point was oil. That's the difference. All that person needed was oil right at that point. They did not need a bit shoved underneath the keratinized proximal nail fold to remove the cuticle, okay? Um, I understand what they're trying to do, which is l lengthen the look of the nail bed and then, of course, make it so that they can put um, more product back into this area so that you get uh, a manicure that lasts a few days longer, okay? The problem is that all of the nail enhancement products that we have, including nail polish, should not be applied to skin, okay? Well, it's really easy for those of us who use nail polish, that just washes off in the shower. Well, acrylic and gel, those do not wash off in the shower. And so if you're getting acrylic and gel underneath into this area, you can cause permanent allergies because those are ingredients that should not be touching our skin. It's totally fine for them to be touching the dead nail plate. They, they don't hurt dead nail plate. It is no worse than dipping your hair in gel. Like, okay, let's think about this. In, you could dip your hair in gel and you could cure it because your hair is dead. We all know that. You could cure it under a UV lamp and then you could soak it in acetone or rubbing alcohol. Now you remove it with acetone. Um, you remove the inhibition layer with, with rubbing alcohol. But you could soak that, your, your hair that's been coated with gel in acetone, and uh, the acetone will dry out your hair, but it will also dissolve that gel, and you will be left, your hair will still be there. Those keratin cells are very, very strong, okay? So it's not the product that's doing it because you're applying it to something that's dead. But the problem comes when we are shoving product up underneath this skin into this area where it's alive. And these products should not be touching your skin. And unfortunately, because they are all related, gel is related very much to acrylic. They're just different hardnesses, but they're, and they're slightly, it's almost like they're sisters, okay? They're very, very related, but slightly different, okay? Um, so once you're allergic to one sister, you're allergic to the other sister, all right? And we don't want that. So we want to be really, really careful so that we can enjoy our nail enhancements for the rest of our lives. All right, so here's an example of those bits, and they are really small. They are really small, but they're spinning at 3,500, no, 35,000, I had it wrong yesterday, 35,000 revolutions per minute. That's a lot. It's just, it's way, way too much. And here in the United States, microdermabrasion is a medical procedure. And I guarantee you, almost no nail techs have an aesthetician's license. It's the aesthetician who's been trained to do microdermabrasion. They understand just how softly or deeply they can go without damaging you. Okay, that, that takes a different license. It's a different license than one to apply acrylic and gel to the nail plate. So here's an example of when those bits are really, really helpful. 
and it's for removing hard product, okay? We don't ever want these bits to touch our nail plate either because as I was showing you before, we've only got about 50 layers. And for those of us who have really thin nails, we've got even less, okay? We don't want something that's spinning that fast, removing our natural nail plate. We really get into, this is what a Russian manicure looks like. And you can see this huge gap. I mean, it almost looks like a cave that you can see under there. And But the thing is that it's the lure of perfection. It doesn't, you don't have the look of dry skin anymore. It's all buffed away. But you can also start to see, and I'm gonna get this next couple of pictures. If you need, if you get squeamish, avert your eyes and just listen to me. But you can kind of see all of these little dots. Those are spots of where the skin has been worn away. And um, and it's incredibly easy for that skin to crack and then also and then germs and bacteria to get in there because our hands are in everything. They're constantly cooking and uh, just whatever. You look at your life and where your hands go and a lot of it's dirty, okay? Even just like right now I'm sitting and my hand's cold and so I've got my one of my hands tucked underneath one of my or I'm wearing blue jeans and I've got one hand tucked underneath the knee of one because I got my legs crossed, shouldn't have that. But anyway, did you know that most of the dust, most of the dust bunnies, most of your dust in your house is either, is skin cells combined with all of the fabric, the stuff that comes off of the, all of these little fibers that come off of our rugs and our carpets and our curtains and our clothes. So like, if I was to actually scratch my jeans right now, I'd end up with, um, I'd end up with jean fuzz under my nails. That's just dust, okay? So our hands are constantly dirty and then we're opening this area. So this is what it looks like. So this is what this looks like at a more microscopic level. And people say, well, I'm not bleeding. Well, you just can't see it. If we look at these two pictures, this is a Russian manicure and this is me, which one do you think is gonna prevent infections better? Okay, so I want you to start to look at other people and don't criticize other people, please, please don't, because what they do with their body is their, is their right, okay? But when, what I'm hoping is that when you know better, you will do better because there is this false sense of perfection that happens with the Russian manicure and it can be just as beautiful by keeping that area of the skin soft with nail oil. So I'll go back and show you this picture of how the difference of getting that, that pointed cone-shaped bit right underneath there and then that just opens all that up and so here's what i was talking about here's the difference of if this person had just oiled her skin at this point it would have looked very similar to mine so i'm sort of wanting to finish this up with beauty should be healthy okay just like we're starting to see over the last five six years i'm finally seeing mannequin mannequins in stores with clothing on that are like bigger than me and I'm a slender person and I'm like that just makes me so happy that I'm seeing mannequins that are like real people real women size so that's what we're it, like women have been screaming for decades this is you know the skinny skinny models is not healthy um you know being having curves women are supposed to have curves that's healthy what I'm really excited about is also we've got a new squeeze pen and so I've been talking about oil a lot a lot and when I'm talking about for those of you if you get a stretched out keratinized proximal nail fold what we want to do is very very gently and I do this with my fingernail I've done it with my fingernails since I was in high school okay but some of you don't have fingernails and so we have this pusher that's on the end and you want to push just gently, very, very, very gently. Your intention is to not shove that skin back. Your intention is to release that skin 
from the cuticle, okay? So that cuticle that's on the nail plate that's like dragging the proximal fold out, you want to separate those two, but not separate them in such a way that it shoves and creates this big cave underneath your proximal nail fold. Also, what's really important for strengthening nails is to, especially for those of us who have thin nails, is to take care of them, keep water out. We want to keep water out of them as much as possible. And we do that with nail polish. We do that with our um, enhancements. Acrylic and gel do the same thing. They block the water absorption from, they block the nail plate from absorbing the water, okay? So I do, personally, two base coat wraps, and wrap is all the way around tips, your free edge tips if you've got them. Um, if you don't, if your nails are short, then you're just going to run the brush along the side and you're going to cap them. Um, and then two layers of color coat, not wrapped, and then one layer of a quick dry top coat wrapped all the way around. Clean off your smudges. Um, some of you, if you don't have time, just use the shower to clean off your smudges. Um, uh, that's okay. But for those of you who are getting gel and acrylic, those products need to be removed right away. They should not sit on your skin at all. Okay. Um, and then if you need to, rinse uh, your hands with a little bit of water and then apply your nail oil. Uh, let me just recap here a little bit that water can go in through these cells and around them, but oil can only go around the cells. And so what we want to do is fill those areas up so that water can't get through. When it's applied and absorbed, Doug says, oils um, and it absorbed into the nail surface, oils will slow down the passage of water through the nail plate. And that's what helps keep them at that right balance. The oils block and temporarily seal the moisture channels. And this can be especially useful for plate, very, very dry nail plates. And that's, this is a big part of how I started my whole business. This is when I started learning this from Doug is when I went, oh, I need nail oil. Okay, I, and all the everything was labeled as cuticle oils at the time. And I went to the store and every single one of them had almond oil in them. And I'm allergic to almonds. And so I was like, hmm, okay, I'll make my own recipe. And then you saw the picture of my nails at their longest um, when I was holding the little yellow flowers. And so my nails were longer than they had ever been. And I was like, oh, now I'm on the right path. Again, to, to reiterate, oils slow down that water evaporation from the nail plate, which increases the moisture content. So trying to put water into your nails from the top doesn't work. What we need is the right blend of what your, your nail bed is doing. It's pushing the right blend of moisture and oil up into the nail plate to keep it softer and flexible. And remember, the keratin cells are really, really strong. Um, but if you, if your nail bed did not send up that right blend of moisture and oil, your nails would get hard and crispy, and then they would lift off the nail bed, and then your nail bed would be exposed, and you would have no nails. Okay, so it all works together synergistically. Uh, I want to show you one thing as well: is that uh, the reason that the nail plate is clear and that you can see your nail bed is because of that moisture that I'm talking about, okay? That's what makes it transparent. Now, when it grows past your hyponychium, then it's no longer getting nourished by the nail, the nail bed, all right? And that's why it changes color. It goes back to being white. And for some of us, as you can see, I have never, ever, ever, ever in my life, even when I had no nail polish. Um, I have never had super, super white tips. It's just me. And then when you put in, when you use our wonderfully golden oil, it actually, that color will go into the nail tips as well. But what I want to show you is I did an intensive hydration treatment. This was only for a couple of hours. And you can see how the nail is starting to turn transparent again. It looks different. Can you see the difference between this is whiter and this has more of a translucency. 
That is because oil, our oil has penetrated all the way through the nail plate, all the way through those layers. And so when I whack my nails into something, they're gonna bend, they're not gonna break. So you wanna make sure that you're applying your oil frequently. Also, it doesn't take very much. It doesn't take very much at all. So I don't want you to feel greasy. I want you to use the tiniest amounts of oil, just enough so that you feel slippery. So final thoughts for this, everybody needs to know this, including nail professionals. And I wish more of this was taught in there. You know, when you know easily how to take part, take care of the parts of your nail unit and what parts can be easily damaged, you'll learn to make better choices. And that's all we're trying to do is just go through life making better choices and being happier. All right, when the proximal fold gets stretched out, yep, the, so the keratinized proximal nail fold gets stretched out, what do you do with that skin? So the first thing I would do is if you're looking at your hands and you have proximal nail fold that is stretched out like Bradley, if you've got this, uh, what you want to do is not push it all back. Don't push it all back to start with. So what you'll want to do is just barely start pushing it back. Don't go all the way back to here because like I was showing you, you'll have this big flap of skin that's gonna dry out really, really fast. So just like flossing your teeth, what you wanna do is slowly start irritating that and separating it back. And the body will respond by making that smaller. I know it sounds weird, but it works, okay? And then that way you don't have this big hunk of skin. So just slowly work it back. You can do it in the shower or you can do it um, if you've oiled your nails and your skin a little bit. You can just slowly start pushing that back. And then once you've got it nice and tight, just every four or five days, just do a little bit. You'll be able to feel it. You'll feel start to feel it being stretched out. Um, big disclaimer, I'm not a doctor or a scientist. I've just been teaching about nails for a very, very long time.